Steve Morgan um, was a good president. Mm -hmm. And while he was here, all these, these good things happened. Uh, he had a, a plan, and um, he pretty well finished it before mm -hmm. he left. Mm -hmm. We began to grow, and when you're not a highly endowed institution and you really rely on tuition for the majority of your funding, the only way to really grow the resources is to grow the enrollment. And it's a challenging model to manage, but as the enrollment grows, then you also need additional facilities. And as facilities age, you need to replace those facilities or at least remodel those facilities. So I think as we continued to grow, we knew we needed to have more space, parking for instance. The eternal problem. The eternal the problem, yes, yes. Yeah. We're landlocked. We are at capacity on this campus, and I need not tell you that. So I think it's just the natural growth pattern of a university, and we were, we started eyeing that property south of Arrow High, the highway that was owned by the Metropolitan Water District. Oh, 30 years ago, probably, wow, wow. and started talking about it. What if we could get that? I wonder if we ever could get that. We had some trustees who were instrumental in opening some doors, and we kept pursuing it, and finally it came to pass. Mm -hmm. And the acquisition of some other smaller pieces around the campus, each one was an interesting challenge, and we often paid top dollar because the seller knew we really <laughs> wanted that piece right. of property. But I used to say, okay, we can pay a premium because we're putting that into our inventory. I give Phil Hockey a lot of credit. He's a, a good negotiator, he's very persistent, and he's the one who really has managed the deals to acquire the property for Campus West, the property for the College of Law in Ontario, some other pieces of property around the campus. And I felt if, if I could leave having added those to the property inventory, then future presidents could determine what to do with that property. But at least the university had property for future growth and expansion and improvement. We were fortunate that the city has always been such a good partner with the university. And we couldn't have done it without them. And, and we worked hard, going way back to, to Skip Monero's time, to build a, a level of trust and partnership with the city. And we've, I think, succeeded in doing that, and they have responded very positively. Welcome to an oral history of the University of Laverne, a documentary series prepared by the students and faculty of Honors 304-351 during the university's 125th anniversary year, 2016-2017. I'm Al Clark, one of the faculty in the course, and I created this episode focusing on some of the accomplishments during the presidency of Stephen Morgan. In addition to giving the institution a firm foundation of fiscal stability for the first time in its history, Dr. Morgan's 26 years saw, among other things, the advent of a, of a number of academic majors, an increase in the number of nationally accredited programs, and even some national athletic championships. Most obviously, his presidency witnessed a significant expansion of the campus and a noticeable improvement in buildings, grounds, and campus quality of life. In recognition of this qualitative change, I call this segment Wilson Library and Campus West. Brian Worley, who was director of facilities for most of the first 20 years of President Morgan's 26-year presidency, perhaps best summarizes the campus improvements during that time. When I started at Laverne, um, we were recovering, I think, from a very down period. The campus was in disrepair. The landscape was really a suffering, huh. but it had a lot of, of potential. You know, there, there were a lot of pluses that just weren't being, you know, given enough attention. I mean, the oak trees on the campus were just incredible, but there was a lot of desolate turf space. More importantly, I don't think that there was a real sense of identity 
among all of the people that worked here. It was a struggle. At a point, a project was identified, uh, funding was identified with a, a benefactor, a trustee, and we created the mosaic entry signs for the University of Laverne. The front onto Bonita Avenue. I remember installing them and there was just this excitement among people that worked here that finally, at last, we are identifying ourselves. David Flotten created the opportunity for those signs. He had a vision and it did. It created an identity for the university. It's all of these things that happened over time and that, that's the way I'm sure Steve Morgan and Ann Morgan looked at it and I was right in sync with them. The cumulative nature of developing project after project that created the campus as it is today was incredible and, and it was transformative. And, and one of the critical things during the time I was here, especially at the beginning, was you, you had to make every nickel scream. You, you had to make every bit of money and funding that you had uh, work. There were projects that we did um, were on a shoestring, yeah. often. You know, it wasn't a lot of money, but we got them done. The college really needed austerity. It was the only way it was going to pull itself out and up. I have to credit Steve Morgan with a lot because he took on a lot. Mm -hmm. When he arrived here, there was a lot to be done. In, in progression, um, Miller Hall, which was full of cats and fenced off uh, before we renovated it, was, was at the heart of the campus. It mm -hmm. was, you know, one of the sort of the major projects that helped to reestablish the campus as a functioning entity. Mm -hmm. Because before it was renovated, here it was, fenced off the oldest building on campus, historic and intriguing, but it, it, it was sitting there empty, vacated. Mm -hmm. And everything was going on around it. It needed uh, to become vital again to the campus. You talk about Miller Hall, and I've always been glad they didn't let us tear it down, actually, because I think it's a landmark on campus. It and is. I think campuses that can reflect their history and their architecture really can tell a story by visual, the visual arts. And it's been a very useful building to us, but it's also a campus icon. It wasn't without problem. And the first was, uh, as we were building it, there was this moment when the steel structure for the elevator to the south of the building had been erected and it was discovered that it was something like three feet short. We had to go through a whole legal issue but we had to keep construction going. So I would be totally remiss if, if I didn't mention the development of the, the Wilson Library. That was another huge uh, project that transformed the campus. Mm -hmm. Because before that, we were working out of a shopping center, you know, a former shopping center. We, it had a tasty freeze at the upper end that became the music practice facility. Um, but the Wilson Library project um, did. It, it, it truly transformed the campus at that point because it became a focal point. Mm -hmm. It became a place to go and study, whereas before it was a converted shopping mall and you walked into the building and it was drab. And with the, the development of the stacks, the the whole new wing of offices and classrooms, the study cubicles, mm. the stacked study cubicles in this, in you know, the main area here. Um, it just became, you know, a, a place for people to go. And we did renovations to all of the buildings on campus while I was here. I was 
director of facilities for 20 years. We progressed through the campus and then even progressed to the point of creating new buildings, the Oaks, um, which was the expansion of on-campus living. The Oaks created just that much more of a critical mass on campus that, that both fed the campus but also helped the downtown area. The renovation of the former citrus packing plant mm. became the art department and that was a real push uh, as summer projects tend to be. The occupancy can't move. Mm because it's tied to the start of school. We were really hard pressed to get that occupancy on that building. In fact, the inspector came to do, give us a conditional occupancy on Labor Day. The day before classes started. <laughs> the Roger Barkley building, I think one of the more interesting things about it was we incorporated vertical greenscape to, uh, because it was, it was an ugly building, it was just a, a factory basically um, and so we put these uh, trellises on it and covered it with plant. The uh, former Armenian college building. We didn't overly work that. The development of the other citrus packing house into um, the uh, facilities building and ultimately um, the off-campus program, when you walk through the space and what we did with it in terms of respecting uh, the fact that it was a packing house but creating viable working space within it. To reuse the packing house has worked very well. Cost certainly to, to keep the Tasty Freeze as a music practice building and not tear it down and build a new one was less costly. Mm. We've been a good example of refurbishing buildings for new uses, but keeping the building itself as a part of the historical story of the city of Laverne and the University of Laverne. The campus center building, mm. the design that was truly interesting for the campus. I, I remember at one point I was working with the architect and he was, he was bemoaning the fact that it was such a tight footprint they were constricted because uh, there's a, a very large metropolitan water district uh, line going down the street right beside the building to the north. And I just looked at him and I said, I have one word for you, it's cantilever. <laughs> and if you look at that building, he took it to heart. One of the other major things that did happen on this campus was installing a central chiller plant which became very significant in terms of just reducing operating costs. Even Brian's extensive summary did not cover all of the acquisitions. Among others were the Marvin and Marie Snell building, currently housing University Advancement, a former church, now the Counseling Center, and its parsonage, now Jaeger House, holding the cultural and natural history collections, the chemical storage facility on the southeast corner of Monero Building, the Hanawalt Fitness Center, now the Dwight Hanawalt Football Complex, the Ortmeyer Stadium Fieldhouse and Corny's Corner attached, and the Vista Laverne Residence Hall, the largest building on campus. The law school was another project. The City of Ontario giving the university, the building, plus over a million dollars to improve it. That was a great project. Farther afield still was the construction of the biological field station in Montana. We started off with two and a half acres, actually. Um, we bought that after um, the 160 acres was given to us. So we bought a couple of parcels down on the Clark Fork River. We didn't realize that it was a super fun site, <laughs> but it's worked out really well because we've got something to research just in water quality, if nothing else in the river. But a lot of other things have come out of it. I built a building on that. It was a big building and we had volunteers galore those first couple of summers 
until we got that first building done. And uh, then we realized we needed some other stuff and a lot of students were coming and we didn't have enough room. So then we built a garage, which upstairs houses about 10 students. We'll, we'll build a new house for you. And we build a new barn. During the Morgan presidency, a number of programs and majors were added. Among them were the honors program, the speech communications major, and the doctor of psychology. The PsyD sought and was granted national accreditation, as did selected other programs at the university. I was on a committee. Uh, it had to do with admissions, the admissions, undergraduate admissions program. And um, I was a faculty representative on that committee. And our job as part of that committee was to evaluate applications from students who were not admissible, uh, um, who are marginally admissible, who right. had uh, either their... Uh, their GPAs from high school or their test scores, SATs, were just a little bit below the threshold. So we would consider each case individually, read their applications, and decide whether or not they would succeed. Mm -hmm. And during the course of reviewing these many, many applications, Pat Combe said, what this school really needs is an honors program because, she said, we, we spend so much time and energy, and we should justifiably helping to make sure that students who needed extra academic support had a fulfilling and enriching experience. But on the other end of the academic spectrum, that is for the more academically successful, gifted, etc., um, we didn't have anything in place. And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, she's right. She's absolutely right. Why shouldn't we, like other schools, have something designed to appeal to students who are more academically motivated or uh -huh. gifted. Or... And so we formed a little committee, maybe a half a dozen people. Uh -huh. So what we did was to um, do some research. We, we found out, for example, that there was um, a national organization, and we came up with a number of possible models. And that's how it started. Team taught interdisciplinary. The first class came in in 1988. I was teaching at Cal State Fullerton in their Department of Communication. Don was working here at Laverne, and John Gingrich contacted me about writing a proposal for what a speech communication department would look like at Laverne, mm. and what would an academic major look like. Uh, and he expressed that they were interested, Laverne was interested in uh, boosting their offerings in this mm -hmm. area because mm -hmm. at the time we had a very and still have a very strong mass communication department which is dealing with mediated forms of communication but we did not do much in human interaction human communication mm -hmm. be beyond just a fundamentals of public speaking course and the debate team so I did a lot of research looking at you know academic programs at other institutions and uh, put the proposal together and then uh, later in that spring, he said, how would you feel about coming to Laverne and helping us implement this? And I was um, partnered with one other faculty member, Ian Leasing. Mm -hmm. And so when we developed this major, we had a couple goals in mind. We wanted it to have a lot of academic rigor to it, but also to be a very practical major, as, as should be the case in terms of building practical social skills for right. someone in a communication major. And the major was really devoted to improving students' um, skills and theory knowledge in both public and private, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. So Ian um, was primarily in charge of more of the public communication courses and the debate courses. And then my specialty area is, um, you know, family interaction, personal, interpersonal communication, mm -hmm. you know, cultural communication, some of the more... Um, private context of right, communication. Right. The PsyD program, how did that come about? At the time of, of its development in 1996, we were still a behavioral science department. The original idea for it came from Dr. Valerie Jordan. I was the department chair. Val's vision was uh, we, we need to go beyond having a, a marriage and family therapy program and everybody in the department chimed in, so we had some psychologists and a couple of sociologists and an anthropologist all trying to share their vision of how this doctoral program in psychology would look. One of the current concerns that people had in the College of Arts and Sciences would this diminish our undergraduate operation, mm. and we assured them that no, it wouldn't. Ironically, though, it did an impact on the undergraduate 
operation. Uh, we had none of us had any idea of the resources required to, to drive this this APA approved program. In order to get final appro APA approval, we we were forced to put people in every year of the program, and so it's a, literally a five-year program, and so it took from 97 to about uh, 2003 before we had people in, in each phase, and then APA, the American Psychological Association, came out and finally gave us full approval. been re-accredited re twice now, and uh, um, the last time for five years, and that'll be good through I believe 2017. The paralegal program at the University of Laverne started in 1972. It was one of the earliest programs actually in, in, in Los Angeles because the paralegal uh, field, if you will, only started maybe a couple of years earlier. It was started by Judge Egley. When Judge Egley started the College of Law, uh, he also thought, you know, we, we maybe should have also a paralegal program. When I was hired, the program was housed at the College of Law. Sometime in the late 90s, the College of Law started thinking about mm -hmm. American Bar Association uh, accreditation. And the College of Law knew, knowing that at that time there was only really one school in the United States, that, a law school, that also had a paralegal program. Uh, it was decided, uh, sorry, but we can't have an undergraduate program while we uh, seek ABA. Mm -hmm. So that started our search for mm -hmm. a new administrative home. We move first to what is now known as the College of uh, Business and Public Administration. And then ultimately we ended up in College of Arts and Sciences. Mm -hmm. Around that time, the program got American Bar Association accreditation approval. The American Bar Association not only is the entity that is recognized by the Depart U.S. Department of Education, to look at law schools, uh -huh. but the organization, the ABA, a national organization of lawyers, also looks into the approval of paralegal programs. At that time, the paralegal position had already developed so that people knew that they were assistants to lawyers. They could not practice law, but they could do a lot of the stuff that lawyers could do. So the ABA thought, you know, yes, we should have a hand in making sure that the paralegals who are the assistants to the lawyers are also properly trained and properly educated. Also as a program, we decided well, we needed to get ABA approval, and uh, we got it. The approval of an ABA paralegal program, you had to have a faculty, you had to have a program of study, you had to have uh, classes that met for a certain number of hours, you had to do a self-study, mm. you had to have a site visit. I became chair in 1988 of the department. I came here in 85 and became chair uh, in 88. Um, and we kept thinking that national accreditation was something we wanted to do. So the faculty were, were considering it. And finally, in uh, 1995, I went to the national meeting at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Ray Garubo, who was the MPA chair and I was the chair of the department, flew to the what's called the Na NASPA, the National Association of Schools of Public Affairs. It's now the network of schools of public administration, public policy and affairs. There we got to meet some of the top people in, the, in our discipline and they talked about accreditation. So on the way back, flying on the uh, flight back, Ray Garuba and I decided that we wanted to go for national accreditation. Now, n no other uh, unit of the college had national accreditation. So on the back of a napkin, we outlined a, a plan to achieve it and it took us five years to reorganize the curriculum to uh, hire faculty that would meet the minimum requirements. By the end of their for time that they're at the University of Laverne, that you will have got them to a level of competence in these areas. And we obviously focused on that hands-on care. And so when we put, were up for initial accreditation, um, yes, there were a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of paperwork. In fact, this is some of the documentation because I have to review through for our current accreditation. Uh, <clears throat> and Marilyn was in charge of that effort. Um, as program director, and then um, the, we had a couple bumps. They had a few things they wanted us to correct um, on that first accreditation pass, but um, we were able to successfully do it. So we were one of the first programs amongst a lot of them that on that first wave were accredited, and then uh, seven years after that we became re-accredited with um, flying colors. They had two things. They said, well, these could be better. Uh, <laughs> 
and so we're we're now in the tail end of a 10 year accreditation cycle. When we needed to become accredited to continue having an athletic training education program here, we received great support. In order to be accredited, we had to have uh, an additional athletic trainer. We got the funding for that mm. so that Paul and I could move into faculty and clinical. We had to, I remember on the exit interview from the accreditation site visit, the, the, um, the site visitors said, you need to have more equipment. Mm. You need to have more therapy modality. But 30 days response time <laughs> to meet right. the standards that you weren't meeting. We were able to get the faculty and the staff we needed. Mm. We were able to get the facilities in 30 days, have them ordered and you know delivered. That brings us up to date with where our athletic training program is now. We are in another accreditation cycle. Mm. Site visit will be next year. And we're doing two things. We're going to phase out the undergraduate athletic training program. And we are going to, in the fall of 17, we anticipate beginning our master's in athletic training. We went from being non-accredited athletic training program to accredited athletic training undergraduate program. And now we're aiming for accredited master's level athletic training program. I had a, an online conversation with a search chair who read that I had a, an extensive background in NK and accreditation. I applied and I came to meet everybody and before I left I had an offer. When I came mid-year to the deanship, I found a college that was eager to understand national accreditation, had already started working toward it, they just needed a focus. They were scheduled for NK and the state review in three years. That was the perfect amount of time to get it done. To set up an assessment system, to begin collecting data, to do in-service training around using data for continuous improvement, all of those significant pieces. So um, the college worked really hard for three years to put all of this together, to build a website, to write the report, to be ready for the visit, and uh, everything went swimmingly. After our visit, NK posted our report on their website as an example of reports that were well done. At the end of my deanship, I started doing some WASC things. In early 2016, the University of Laverne's College of Law achieved American Bar Association accreditation. Forty-six years ago, when the University of Laverne Law School first began, it was a twinkle in Judge Paul Egley's eye. And Judge Egley could not be here today so I'm going to read you his very short message about the University of Laverne College of Law ABA accreditation. And he says, congratulations. I'm so proud that Laverne College of Law is now an ABA school. Since I opened its doors in 1970, it was my goal to obtain ABA. Our College of Law is the only ABA approved law school in the Inland Empire and um, this is an area that is woefully underserved with practicing attorneys. According to the state bar, we have one attorney for every 125 residents in the state. However, in the counties of Riverside, San Bernardino, there are fewer than 5,500 practicing attorneys with a population of 4 million, which equates to one in every 725 residents. So when you consider the region is one of the fastest growing areas with the majority of its citizens comprised of ethnic minorities, you begin to really see the significance of this accreditation and how important it is to the overall mission of the institution. The most interesting shift in accreditation is every accreditation organization is asking colleges and universities, what is it that makes them special? The question is, when a student gets a degree from the University of Laverne, what does that mean? We should be able to say to a student, when you get a, a degree from the University of Laverne, you 
should be grounded in values, you should be um, engaged in your community, you should be a critical thinker, uh, you should be uh, well versed in in understanding research and the use of libraries, etc. That big question has resulted in some requirements and some of those requirements are that every institution have a set of goals mm. which led to our development of baccalaureate goal. The graduate programs which are somewhat harder to, to define are still working on a set of uh, graduate goals university-wide. The University of Laverne's baseball and volleyball teams won three national championships from 1995 through 2001. We were real strong up the middle, which is where, what you really need to be. We went 39 and 9 and won the national championship. The championship game with Methodist College from North Carolina, we built a 5 nothing lead. We were the home team. So going into the ninth inning, they scored three runs, and we changed our pitching and was able to shut them down, and the final score was five to three. Now that was a nail-biter. <laughs> the final year of Jimmy's uh, career, we lost in the Sweet 16 yeah. uh, down at UC San Diego uh, to UC San Diego, who won the national championship and won the conference, and I took over as the head coach in the fall of 98. Our first two seasons, we were second in the conference and uh, was blessed to uh, get things turned around. So we won nine straight conference championships. And uh, in 2001, we won the national championship. In 2008, we lost uh, my final match and final season with Laverne was 2008, we lost the national championship to Emory University. And we had a national player of the year. We went to five final fours in, that, in those 11 seasons. We won the conference nine of those 11 seasons. And we set the conference record for most consecutive wins uh, wow. of any program. Jimmy invited me to come back and be his assistant in uh, the fall of 92. Took over the men's program in the spring of 93. Mm. Um, I led the men's program from 93 till 98, and then that next season that men's team won the national championship. Under uh, head coach Jack Coberly, won Division Three uh, national championship. Not sponsored by the NCAA because didn't have enough Division Three teams to establish the championship, but it was sponsored by one of the volleyball companies. It was the Molten USA Volleyball National Championship. The fun thing about volleyball at Laverne was that it was a Division Three program, but we played Division One schools because Division One schools are all on the West Coast because of the beach and the weather, and so we would play Long Beach, and these are all the top schools, the top ten schools, Northridge, USC, we played Harvard. We played mostly at Division I schools. We played Princeton, we played Navy, we played Long Beach State, we played University of California, Santa Barbara. We were the only Division Three team basically on the West Coast that had uh, Division Three volleyball on the whole West Coast. Not many Division Three schools on the West Coast. Back then we had the old gym. We used to practice in there and I remember slipping and sliding around and we ended up winning a Division Three national championship got a ring that was in Dubuque, Iowa. I remember on that trip we, we, we visited the, the Field of Dreams set. <laughs> and that was kind of a fun memory with the team. That first year was the best. We won the championship. Um, we didn't repeat that. We went back to the finals the second year. It sure put our name out in the volleyball world, but that program was dropped uh, during uh, Ragsdale's tenure as the athletic director. And that's a written reason too. We got rid of men's volleyball to try to get even. That was one of the big reasons. Obviously it's financially draining a little bit because we have a non-conference sport and, and we had a good men's team and but there really it wasn't a, a conference for men's volleyball. You know, we're playing everybody financially yeah. and because of Title IX we got rid of it. And, and this Chris Ragsdale got a lot of yeah. heat for that. I could see both sides of it. Going back to the philosophy that if you're going to be a conference member you need to try to field every sport possible that the conference sponsors. I was opposed to having an off-campus swimming pool, but at the same time I said, well, it's better to be a good member of the 
of the uh, conference than it is, and provide uh, the swimming activity. The swimming is, is an expensive program because you, you got you, there's a lot of cost in maintaining a swim, uh, a swim pool. And we were pretty successful right away, both in water polo and swimming. We even won a conference championship in water polo pretty quickly, and we've had some good water polo players. I think it's a good activity for, for students. The bad thing about it is our students, even though it's only a mile or a mile and a half away, don't really have good access to the program. And, and if we had our own campus pool, uh, that would be uh, absolutely great for the recreation and for the student body and for faculty too. Hopefully, we have our own pool eventually. I would like to thank these people for assistance in creating the series and oral history of the University of Laverne. I'd like to thank the University Archives for the use of these digital resources and the following interviews. Finally, I would like to acknowledge that many of the illustrations used in this documentary came from the works of Herbert Hogan, as well as from the Lambda yearbooks. Happy birthday, University of Laverne. I wish you another 125 great years.